Conference has concluded. Questions without notice. I give the call to the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, how many Australian families have received payments to date from the Prime Minister's so-called energy price relief plan? Order. Order. Members on my right, the Treasurer will cease interjecting. The Prime Minister has the call. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, as we have said, the Energy Price Order. Relief Plan will be included in the budget. In budget. Included in the budget. Uh, the figures will be there. And you wanted nobody here. Order. The Minister for Skills will cease interjecting. Members on my left. The Prime Minister has the call. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. And those opposite, including the Leader of the Opposition, voted against it. I give the call to the member for Lingiari. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Indigenous Australians. Minister, how is the government advancing the constitutional recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people through the establishment of the voice? Give the call to the Minister for Indigenous Australians. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the member for Lingiari for her question and her imm immense support through what has been a remarkable process. The Constitution is the founding legal document of our nation. For 65,000 years, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been speaking more than 300 languages. But under our constitution, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians have, ha have had no voice, no say in the matters that have affected our communities. For far too long, governments have made decisions for Indigenous Australians and not with Indigenous Australians. As Nathan Apo said today, our people are living in poverty. They need a voice. We need recognition. We need a voice to the parliament. We've seen over years and years of changing government how we've had to travel down and fight just to exist for our people, for our elders. Today, my friend, the Attorney General, introduced the Constitution Alteration Bill into the parliament. It sets out the question and constitutional amendment that will be put to the Australian people at a referendum later this year. It's a simple question. A proposed law to alter the constitution to recognise First Peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Do you approve this proposed alteration. It's a simple question, a matter from the heart. It is the culmination of so much consultation and hard work. I want to thank members of the referendum working group, the referendum engagement group, some of who have joined us here today, and the legal expert group for their wisdom and their dedication. I want to finish with this quote from Noel Pearson. And I want, and I ask everyone to listen to this. Now is the time for us to act as Australians, not as Labor people, not as Greens, not as Liberal or National Party people, not as Indigenous or non-Indigenous people, but as Australians, because what we are trying to achieve here is unity. We want inclusion, a better future, and this will do it. Yeah. Give the call to the Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Prime Minister. Is there any issue on which the voice will not be able to provide advice to government? And is the Prime Minister Order. able to factually respond without taking personal offence to reasonable questions? and without his usual indignation.
Order. The members on my left, the member for Groom, members on my right. The question was in order, and I'll give the call to the Prime Minister. Order. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I keep the Uluru Statement from the heart framed on the wall of my office. Such an economy of words, but it demonstrates such a generosity of spirit. It is a patient, gracious call to be heard by the First Peoples of Australia to have a say. And the concluding words of the statement are this. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. This is an invitation to all of us as Australians, right across Australia. And I do see more and more Australians taking up this invitation. On the 17th of April, I'll be with a former member of this place, the Liberal member for MacArthur, Pat Farmer. Pat Farmer is, of course, an ultra-marathoner and fitter than anyone who is still here now. He, he, is, going to, he is going to run 14,000 kilometres in a six-month run around Australia in support of constitutional recognition and a voice to parliament. 80 kilometres a day, beginning in Hobart, and he will be seen off by uh, the uh, Tasmanian Premier I've spoken to about him being in attendance and the Tasmanian opposition leader as well, passing through every state and territory. Yesterday, the Collingwood Football Club announced their support in a statement. They said this, the board's support for a First Nations voice to parliament Order. is a natural progression of its commitment to doing and being better. Many, many other groups Order. Prime Minister will pause and I'll hear from the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Um, on relevance, Mr Speaker, I thank the Prime Minister Order. for this calm Members manner. On my right, However, Member Cunningham. he is not addressing any part of the question at all, which Order. is issues on which the voice Order. will not be able to provide advice. The Deputy, Leader. Order. the Deputy Leader will resume her seat. The question was about the issues surrounding the voice. And advice to the government. I'm listening carefully to the Prime Minister. He's provided some background context, and I'll ask him to return to the question. Mr. Speaker, and it, it also went to the nature of the way uh, that I'm answering the question. Yeah. And if the Deputy Leader didn't want order, that, order, uh, the then she should have framed the question in a least personal way. Order. But what I, what I do note is that overwhelmingly, Overwhelmingly, there is goodwill from school groups, community groups, local councils. All want to be a part the of the historic, unifying moment. Sporting organisations, leaders of every faith in Australia, seven religious charities, including St Vincent de Paul and the Salvation Army, minerals groups like BHP, Rio Tinto, Origin and West Farmers, NAB, the Commonwealth Bank, ANZ, Woolworths, Coles, all of these bodies. All of these bodies uniting for a better Australia, uniting in a positive way. And I'd say, I'd say that those people of goodwill will continue to advocate for a yes campaign when the referendum is held. Concluded. For order, before I, the member for Wannan, before I call the member for Wills, I'm pleased to invite to inform the House that present in the gallery today are committee members of the government's youth advisory groups. A very warm welcome to our young visitors. I'm also pleased to inform the House that present in the gallery today is a visiting delegation of members from the Thai Parliament and also the 24th delegation from the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, led by His Excellency Norvang Quang. On behalf of the House, a warm welcome to you all. And I give the call to the member for Wills. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. What is the focus of the Albanese Labor government's second budget and how will it deliver for Australians and their economy? And, Treasurer, what challenges does the budget have to deal with? Give a call to the Treasurer. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker, and to the member for Wills for his question. And I acknowledge as well the youth advisory groups uh, who have joined us in the parliament today. Welcome. Uh, we're very pleased to see you. 
Mr Speaker, as you know, this is the last sitting day before a budget which will be finalised against the backdrop of inflation, which is moderating but still unacceptably high, and in an environment of global economic uncertainty. Uh, this week I spoke with US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and European Central Bank Christine Lagarde uh, ahead of our discussions with G20 economic ministers and central bank governors in a couple of weeks in Washington, D.C., and that will help us understand the global conditions as we put the finishing touches on the budget. International authorities are working closely together to do what is necessary to reassure markets and provide some extra liquidity into the banking system, and that has had a calming effect on markets. Uh, this morning I convened the Council of Financial Regulators, and their message Order. is very clear. Our banks are well capitalised, well regulated and well placed to deal with this uncertainty. Our authorities are confident but not complacent about these conditions, and we are vigilant as a government. But volatility in financial markets, combined with the war in Ukraine and the impact of higher interest rates, is creating uncertainty around the world in the global economy. Now, we've got a lot going for us here, Mr Speaker. Low unemployment, good prices for our exports, uh, strong banks, but we've got a lot coming at us as well. And Australians are still under the pump, and we understand that. Inflation is, as I said, unacceptably high, but it's clearly moderating in welcome ways as well. The Reserve Bank Board will weigh all of this up when they take their decision independently on uh, Tuesday. But our job, uh, Mr Speaker, in this environment is to provide relief and repair and show restraint in the budget when there's a trillion dollars in Liberal debt to deal with and billions of dollars of unfunded programs as well. And so the budget will put a premium on what's responsible and affordable and sustainable, and it will be all about cost of living relief, including uh, energy bill relief that those opposite voted against. It will invest in the care economy and decent services. It will fund our national security priorities. It will fix our supply chain so we can grow our economy the right way. It will begin to break down the barriers to women's participation in the economy. It will try and tackle entrenched disadvantage in local communities at the same time as we get the budget under control and clean up the mess that we inherited from those opposite. Mr Speaker, the budget will be all about providing security in these uncertain economic times so that we give Australians the help that they need and the economic future that they deserve. I look forward to handing down the budget from this dispatch box in 40 days' time. Yeah. Give a call to the honourable member for Warringah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. To the Prime Minister, yesterday I met with the elders from Save Sorry Business using their voice to seek compensation for the harm caused by the failed Eupla ACBF scheme. So many trusted and invested in this scheme because they thought it was government endorsed through Centrelink. The collapse of this scheme has delayed families being able to put loved ones to rest. Will the Prime Minister listen to the voice of these elders and pay compensation to so many affected in the May budget? Give the call to the Assistant Treasurer. Mm -hmm. thanks, thanks so much, and I thank the member for Warringah for her question. I too was at the meeting uh, that you referred to, and I thank the Speaker for uh, welcoming the members of the Sorry, Safe Sorry Business Coalition into the Speaker's uh, rooms yesterday. What happened in Eupla, what was previously known as the Aboriginal Benefits Fund, was a disgrace. It wasn't for Aboriginal people, it wasn't for the benefit of Aboriginal people, it wasn't run by them. And what we saw over a period of upwards of 30 years uh, was Aboriginal people being flogged, dodgy insurance products, manipulating their concern to ensure that their funerals were paid for, um, and it was a disgrace. And it was why one of the first things that uh, the Minister for Indigenous Affairs and myself acted upon when we came into government was to ensure that we could put in place an interim arrangement, because when we came into government there were bodies in morgues. There were bodies in morgues because the company had collapsed and they could not afford to bury them. So our first act when we came into government was to ensure that we put in place an interim scheme to make sure that we could get those bodies out of, the, out of morgues and that families could bury their loved ones. Now, Mr Speaker, over the course of this week, there's been a lot of discussion about the sorts of things that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people 
should have a voice to parliament on. I can only think that if over the last 30 years we had been listening to the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, then we would not have let this scheme go on for so long and we would have ensured that the people that the member for Warringah have drawn our attention to had their issues dealt with and this scheme was closed down. The government is committed to ensuring that we put in place an enduring solution for these people, but in the meantime, the we'll ensure that the funerals get paid I'll hear from the member for Ringara on a point of order. Relevance. It was directly relating to the May budget. The minister has concluded his answer. Order. I give the call to the member for Holt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Women. What action is the Albanese Labor government taking to help close the gender pay gap? Give the call to the minister representing the Minister for Women. Um, thank you so much, Mr Speaker, and can I thank very much the member for Holt for her question, but also for her long-standing advocacy uh, for equality for women. Of course, all of us in this place agree that Australian women deserve fair and safe working conditions, they deserve equal opportunity and equal remuneration for their efforts. I'm very pleased uh, to report that this House has passed the Workplace Gender Equality Amendment, closing the gender pay gap bill 2023, and I thank all members for their support for that. It fulfils, of course, a major election commitment to close the gender pay gap at work including by boosting pay gap transparency and encouraging action to close gender pay gaps within organisations. These reforms will be a key driver for employer action, transparency and accountability and will help speed up progress towards gender equality in our workplaces while at the same time streamlining reporting for employers. For the first time, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency will report uh, gender pay gaps at the employer level, not just the industry level. And it will certainly help encourage companies to prioritise gender equality and to work cl to close their gender pay gap, and it will, of course, accelerate progress towards gender equality. It will give us more information about gender pay gaps and put employers on notice to take action. Of course, estimates indicate that at the current rate of progress, it could take as long as 24 years to close the gender pay gap. Women have waited long enough, and it is very pleasing to note that this place uh, and the Senate have agreed that that is too long. The average weekly full-time earnings of a woman in Australia across all industries and occupations is lower than the equivalent for men by $253.50 per week. We see a gender pay gap from the moment women are entering the workforce and a gender pay gap accumulated over our lifetimes, and it has real consequences. Women have on average 23.4 per cent less super when they come to retirement age than men. The gender pay gap is also holding our economy back, with $51.8 billion a year lost when it comes to women's pay. This bill, uh, now passed through both houses, is a critical step towards achieving women's economic participation and women's equality. The bill is getting on with the job of closing the gender pay gap for women in Australia. I um, think, thank very much uh, everyone in this place for actually the passage of this bill, but also uh, it's taken a majority Labor government to get this done and to start to finally close the gender pay gap for women in this country. Yeah. The call to the member for Hume. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Order. Will the Prime Minister rule out any changes in the budget to the tax treatment of work expenses? Order. The, I could not hear the, treasurer's, the shadow treasurer's question. Out of respect for him, I'm going to ask him so I can hear and the whole chamber can hear the question. I give the call to the honourable member for Hume. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister rule out any changes in the budget to the tax treatment of work expenses? Give the call to the Prime Minister. Uh, like, like other uh, governments in the past, uh, what we will do is hand down our budget in 40 days' time, the Treasurer said, and it will be a good one. And what we'll be aiming at doing, what we'll be, what, what we'll be aiming at doing there Order. is addressing 
both the short-term pressures that are on cost of living, and you'll see those measures, including our Never energy price that. relief plan, including, of course, the other plans budgeted for, cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines, all of those measures. Uh, but you'll also see the funding of plans that are based upon dealing with the medium and longer term challenges in our economy. The pressures that are on the health system, the pressures that are on supply chains through our National Reconstruction Fund, dealing with skills and making sure that people can get appropriate uh, training and education going Order. forward as well. The, the member for Morton, the Prime Minister concluded his answer. <laughs> order. I'll hear from the member for Hume on a point of order. Re relevance, Mr. Speaker. It was a very specific question. We don't need pixie dust. The the member for Hume knows that is not an appropriate use of the standing order, and has the MPI today. <laughs> the Prime Minister will return to the question. Well, one, of, one of the things I, I was surprised to see them taking a point on relevance. Never has an opposition worked so hard to make themselves irrelevant. <laughs> irrelevant. On every issue. Order, the Prime Minister will and return. I predict this, Order, the Prime I Minister predict will return this to the about our budget next month. Whatever's in it, you'll be against it. <laughs> Order. Order. When the House. The member for Morton is warned. <laughs> order. When the House comes to order, well, it would have done. It would have done something today. Um, <laughs> order. I'll hear from the member for Swan. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. To Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. How will passage of the Albanese government's safeguard reforms progress action on climate change and deliver a strong economy? And are there any obstacles to these reforms? Order. Give the call to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. I recognise the expertise and experience of the member for Swan in climate change and resources and I appreciate her counsel as well as her question. And I'm very pleased to inform the member for Swan and the House that just before question time, the government's safeguard legislation passed the Australian Senate 32 votes to 26. Mr. Speaker. What the parliament has done Order. today is safeguard our climate, safeguard our economy and safeguard our future, Mr. Speaker. What the Parliament has done today is draw an end to 10 years of dysfunction and 10 years of delay. What the Parliament has done today is start the Australian industrial economy on the road to decarbonisation. We can now get on with the job of reducing our emissions by 43 per cent. We can now get on with the job of creating jobs of the future in a decarbonised economy. That's what this Parliament has done today, Mr Speaker. I've met just even today with chief executives of Australian industry who have told me now they have the certainty to make investments which will reduce carbon and create jobs. Now they have the certainty, they have told me and the government, and they are, they are keen to get on with it. Order. And I, want to, I want to note, Mr Speaker, and I want to thank, I want to thank the Senate, I want to thank Leader the Green the Senators, I want to thank Senator Lambie, Senator Tyrrell, Senator Thorpe and Senator Pocock. The vote of 32 to 26. And the vote in the House of 87 to 55 means that this parliament reflects the will of the Australian people, Mr yeah. Speaker, yeah. reflects the will of the Australian people to take action on climate. I was asked if there were any obstacles. Well, there were a few. There were a few. There is a rump Order. of irrelevance, but that rump of irrelevance has been overcome. And the numbers in the House and in the Senate reflect the broad coalition, the government's policy has been supported by the Business Council of Australia and the Climate Council, the Australian Conservation Foundation and the Australian Industry Group, Australian the Chamber of Commerce and Industry and, and groups right the across the board. The Albanese government knows how to build coalitions, Mr Speaker. The coalition has forgotten. There's a broad coalition in favour of support and a little coalition fighting on against action on climate change. For too long in this country, the government of the day 
weaponise climate policy to divide Australians, Order. to pit Australians in the regions against Australians in the cities. This government uses climate to unite Australians in our great national endeavour to reduce our emissions and create the jobs of the future. In the regions right across Australia, the great regions that power, that power Australia, those regions will be the centre of our renewable economy. This government gets on with the job and gets over 10 years of denial and delay. Yeah. The member for Lawler. Give the call to the Leader of the Nationals. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Under government modelling, how much will electricity prices increase for households and businesses from the safeguard mechanism? Give the call to the Minister for Climate Change and Zero. Energy. Zero. Because the electricity sector Order. is not covered by the safeguards mechanism. The member for Fairfax. Order. Members on my right. The the leader of the Nationals will. The, the Minister for Climate Change and the Minister for Home Affairs will cease interjecting immediately, as will the member for Groom, or he shall be warned as well. So I can hear from the member for McEwen. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Industry and Science. How is the Albanese Labor government delivering on its commitment to, us, to support Australian manufacturers and create jobs? What opposition has there been to these efforts? Give a call to the Minister for Industry and Science. Thanks, Speaker, and thanks to the member for McEwen for the question and also for his service as the Chair of the House of Representatives, Industry, uh, Science and Resources. And speaker, when you talk with any Australian manufacturing worker, the one thing that stands out uh, in them is pride. They are proud of what they make. They're proud of the products that they're making a contribution to the economy. Uh, they're proud of what they're doing for exporting, and they're proud to make a difference in someone's lives. And a lot of us know this firsthand because we're the sons and daughters of manufacturing workers. We've seen it in our own families. And the $15 billion National Reconstruction Fund uh, that got the support of the parliament this week uh, is not just providing growth capital for those firms, it's sending an important signal. It's Australians backing Australians. It is about the fact that we've got the backs of Australian manufacturing workers and their businesses, that modern economies, especially big economies, need a strong manufacturing capability running through them. Manufacturing matters. It creates secure jobs, and it's, uh, and it's not just in our cities, but it's in our regions as well. Uh, for example, in Victoria, more than a quarter of manufacturing jobs in the regions. In New South Wales, 35 per cent. In Queensland, over 40 per cent. Now, the NRF should be a platform to create secure jobs in sectors and in activities like value-adding in resources, in agriculture fisheries, forestry, defence, renewables and low emission technologies, medical sciences, advanced manufacturing. Creating work for boilermakers through to bioengineers, designers through to fitters and turners, medical scientists, warehouse managers, software experts, technicians and more. We want the NRF uh, to have a strong regional impact. But you couldn't help, when you listen carefully to the Liberal and National attack lines used to attack manufacturing and the National Reconstruction Fund, you, you didn't feel like they were talking about us. You thought more about them. It was Liberal and National MPs talking about jobs for mates. It was Liberal and National MPs talking about slush funds. It was Liberal and National MPs talking about politically motivated projects in marginal seats. Now, the sad reality is they're talking about the way they did business. That's the way they looked at it. Order, members on my and left. I'm sad to inform the Liberal and National parties that, well, your business model is finished. Drawing on the greats like Monty Python, it's a the dead parrot of a business model. Barker. It's joined the choir in Visibule. It is gone. We are done with doing that. It is about an independent board making decisions free of colour coded spreadsheets not doing it in the way that you did business and importantly importantly Order. backing Australian manufacturing because that the house comes to all here for the member for Casey my question to the prime minister more and more Australians are having to make difficult decisions to make ends meet uniting care 
has told the Senate's inquiry into Labor's cost of living crisis that they're witnessing a surge in first-time support recipients who they describe as double-income earning families finding themselves at risk of poverty, homelessness and financial stress. When will this out-of-touch Prime Minister finally admit to Order. Australian families they will always pay more under Labor? Order. Give the call to the Prime Minister. Thanks, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for Holt. Casey, sorry. For Casey for his, for his question. Um, the fact is that we are taking action Order. Uh, to address cost of living pressures. Uh, we know that inflation is causing pressures in households, in the members' electorate and in electorates right around Australia. And that's why uh, we've introduced uh, cheaper medicines, why we're having cheaper childcare, why we've got fee-free TAFE. And I've, I've certainly Member visited Lindsay. the TAFE areas in the uh, members' uh, electorate, in fact, in the past, and know the good work that they do. Um, i tell you what we won't do, though. What we will do as a Labor government is always protect people who are vulnerable. And that stands in stark contrast to what those opposite did, which is to establish an illegal scheme, robo-debt, which attacked the most vulnerable. So that's the contrast between this government and the former government. Order. Uh, Sandra Bevan, who appeared at the Commission, was a, is a single mum of four sons who received a $3,000 Centrelink Prime debt will, letter. The Prime Minister will pause. The order. I'll hear from the Manager of Opposition Business. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, on relevance, you previously directed the Prime Minister back to the topic of a question when he's veered off it, as he have. This is a question about cost of living crisis in the United Kingdom. Order. The, I want to deal with this issue at the end of these questions, there is a tag question about who pays more under which government. If that is part of a question, when that's included, that's inviting a comparison and it's also inviting to talk broadly about who does pay more or less under which government. So if you don't want that part of the question to be answered, don't include that in the question. I call the Prime Minister. Thank, 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 thanks, Mr Speaker. This is what Sandra Bevan had to say. There were these threats of taking money directly out of my pay or out of my bank account from a tax return. It was such a weight on my shoulders. I do remember driving home at night the just thinking, just beside myself with worry about this money and thinking, to quote her, I could just drive my car into a tree and make it stop. But my kids needed me. They'd already lost their dad, and I was trying my best to keep a roof over our head. Matthew Thompson appeared at the Commission as well. He incorrectly was told he owed $11,000. He said this, the robo-debt scheme has had a, hasty, a lasting effect on me as it had on many others. It made my mental health worse. It made me feel like a criminal and a cheat. It really mis messed me up. The ministers who gave evidence were referred Order to as the, the honourable, but given what they said Leader of the or opposition. did, I don't think they are honourable, and I don't think they deserve to be called the honourable. The deputy leader of the opposition, the deputy leader of the opposition, needs to cease interjecting; otherwise, action will be taken. They were the architects of the scheme, which has caused so much pain to so many people and which has caused some people to lose their lives. That is a direct result of what those opposite did. That's a different approach that we have towards people who are vulnerable in our community. Give the call. The, the member for Lyons is warned. I can't be clear about interjecting between someone is about to ask a question. If this happens one more time, you'll be ejected from the chamber. 
give the call to the member for Werriwa. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Communications. What is the Albanese government doing to protect vulnerable Australians from gambling harms, including gambling-like features in video games? Give the call to the Minister for Communications. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for her question. In only 10 months, the Albanese government has taken a range of important steps to minimise harm from gambling. We have implemented three long overdue elements of the National Consumer Protection Framework. Mandatory monthly activity statements came in last year, and from today, new evidence-based taglines with messages about the potential harms of gambling must be in place, as well as training for online wagering staff. Yeah, yeah. And yesterday, I announced the government will seek the agreement of the states and territories to introduce mandatory minimum classifications for games with gambling-like features. Research commissioned by my department has found concerning associations between gambling-like features in games and harms, including problem gambling. Games with simulated gambling will be classified R18+, restricted to 18 and over, and games containing paid loot boxes, where a player can purchase a virtual box with a randomised prize inside, will attract an M rating. We know Australians value the classification framework, and these new ratings will send a strong message that there are risks associated with these products, so consumers can make an informed choice about what they and their children watch and play. But, Mr Speaker, the classification framework is in urgent need of updating. The 2020 Stevens Review, which I also released yesterday, made a range of recommendations to update the framework, including to the classification of games. Mr Speaker, those opposite received this report when they were in government back in May 2020, but they sat on it, taking no action in response to the growing body of evidence about the harms associated with gambling-like features in games. It's another example of the former government talking big about keeping Australians safe, yet they failed to respond to their own review, which showed a clear need for stronger protections. In contrast, the Albanese government is acting on this as a priority. In fact, what we are proposing actually goes further than what the Stevens Review recommended. The classification framework is one avenue to address harms associated with gambling-like features, and we know that we need a multifaceted approach. I've therefore asked my department to examine non-classification options to further the objective of harm minimisation in this area. And I note this matter is also being considered by the House inquiry into online gambling. I look forward to working with my counterparts in the states and territories to implement these changes so we can protect those most vulnerable in our community from gambling harms, including children. The, before I call the member for Indi, I understand that an unparliamentary term was used by the member for Cunningham. I'm going to ask her to withdraw that comment. I'll just wait till the microphones are on and ask you to withdraw. I withdraw. I thank the member. I give the call to the member for Indi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question the is to the Minister. Page is warned. The member for Indi will begin her question again. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Housing. 2021 census data released last week revealed that in Wangaratta, homelessness has increased 67 per cent since 2016. With the passage of the government's Housing Australia Future Fund legislation in doubt, I'm worried we will be left without a plan to fix this urgent problem. Order. Order. What's your plan B to guarantee my constituents will have a roof over their heads? Give the call to the Minister for Housing, Homelessness and the Minister for Small Business. Thanks, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Indi for her question, and I also thank her for her constructive discussions around the Housing Australia Future Fund for when we passed it through this House, and I thank her for her support for that important piece of legislation. Because, of course, she does understand that this is critical to Australia's homeless people. On census night in 2021, there was 123,000 homeless Australians, and it is concerning, and it should be concerning to all of us in this place. It's a really serious issue. 
And indeed, uh, that is why we last week announced some important funding for homelessness services for the Reconnect service over $90 million and indeed an additional amount of $67.5 million for states and territories for homelessness services. This is on top of, of course, the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement, whereby we have just offered the states an additional $1.6 billion for the next 12 months. That's $1.6 billion for the next 12 months for housing and homelessness services that we have offered to the states and territories. And of course, this fits uh, with our housing accord, our national housing accord that was in our last budget. Our national housing accord of course is another 10,000 affordable and social homes, uh, particularly affordable rentals, then this will be matched by the states and territories. That's 20,000 affordable rentals from the National Housing Accord announced in our last budget. We've already immediately released the $575 million from the National Infrastructure Facility and there are already properties starting to go up on the ground around Australia today because of that money. So I'd say to the member for Indi, and I really appreciate this question, that we are having a broad housing agenda. Uh, obviously the Housing Australia Future Fund is central to that because that will allow us to work with other tiers of government, with institutional investors, with community housing providers and indeed to leverage to get more homes on the ground more quickly, which is why it's so important. And as she indicated, there are vulnerable people right across Australia today that need that legislation through the parliament. So I would say to those opposite, talk to your senators in the Senate and tell them how important this legislation is. If you're serious about housing and the housing situation in Australia today, we need that bill through the parliament. And I would say to the Greens political party, uh, this needs to be done and needs to be done quickly. Uh, we are Casey. already delaying this because, of course, the Greens wouldn't allow us to debate it in the Senate. So I say to the Greens political party, you go back to your electorates and you tell people that houses are not on the ground today because this was not able to be brought on in the Senate. There are vulnerable people in Australia today Order. that need these houses and they need them today. Yeah. Give the call to the member for Paterson. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education. What is the Albanese government doing to make sure the next school funding agreement delivers a better and fairer education system? And how's this different to previous approaches, Minister? Give the call to the Minister for Education. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank my friend, the sensational member for Patterson, for her question? We've got a good education system in Australia, but it can be a lot better and a lot fairer. In January, the Productivity Commission released a report that revealed if you're a child from a poor family or from the bush or an Indigenous Australian, you are three times more likely to fall behind at school. And that report told us that over the last 10 years, we've seen the reading skills of children in primary school improve, but the gap in reading skills of children from wealthy families and poor families at primary school get worse. And that report also told us that if you're a child from a poor family and you go to a school where there's a lot of disadvantage, then it's harder to catch up. And that weighs heavily on me because I went to a school like that. These are the sort of problems we've got to tackle. Now, funding is important, but so is what it's spent on, what it's invested in and what it's tied to. That Productivity Commission report was critical of the current schools agreement because it said it lacked real targets and it lacked the practical reforms that we need to tie that to to tackle these sorts of problems. And I've told, I've told this parliament before that the next agreement will, that it will have those targets and it will have those sorts of practical reforms. Yesterday I announced the expert panel whose job it will be to provide education ministers with what those targets should be and what those reforms should be that we tie future funding to. And leading this work will be Dr Lisa O'Brien, the chair of the Australian Education Research Organisation and the former CEO of the Smith family. Dr Lisa O'Brien will lead a team that also includes Lisa Paul, Professor Stephen Lamb, Dr Jordana Hunter, Dion Anderson and Professor Parsi Solberg. They will report to me and other education ministers by the end of October. This is a big year, Mr Speaker, for education. Last month, the Prime Minister announced Professor Deborah Brennan will lead the most comprehensive review of early education in Australia's history. 
At the other end of the education spectrum, Professor Mary O'Kane is leading the University's Accord, the biggest review of higher education in 15 years. And in between is the work that Dr Lisa O'Brien will lead. Weaving through all of this is a common thread, though, and it's about opportunity. If you're a child today from a poor family or from the bush or an Indigenous Australian, you're less likely to go to preschool, you're more likely to fall behind at primary school, you're less likely to finish high school and less likely to go to university. This is a chance to change that. Yeah. Give the call to the member for Durack. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. The Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman has told the Senate inquiry into Labor's cost of living crisis that the rising cost of living is having an acute adverse impact on small and family businesses that underpin livelihoods. Prime Minister, why do Australian families and businesses always pay more under Labor? The call to the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Again, we've got that tag in there. Uh, which, uh, which allows me to do a comparison Order. between this government and the former government. Although there's a link there, because if I'm not mistaken, it's a former minister in the former government who's made the submission that you're talking about. Is that right? Is Order. that right? The, the Prime Minister. <laughs> Order. Is that right? Just the so, Prime Minister will direct comments so, through the chair. So. The political appointment made that. by those opposite that they leave out of the question <laughs> that they leave out of the question gives a submission which is a pro-Liberal Party submission from the former pro-Liberal Party minister. Well, shock horror. Order. Deirdre Order. Chambers, what a coincidence. <laughs> I mean, but the member from Western Australia, of course, I, I, I do note that in Western Australia uh, today there's a bit of a comparison about the former government and this government. Uh, on a day when my Attorney General has introduced very important legislation in this parliament, the former Attorney General of the former government is suing, is a part of Clive Palmer's operation to sue the WA government for $300 billion. $300 billion. Order. Order. The Liberal Party were anti-WA when they were in government. Order. The they're anti-WA, now they're the opposition. The Prime Minister will pause. And they're anti -W the, Prime Minister will, the member for Hume. Member for Hume. Members on my right. Will cease interjecting, and the deputy leader, the deputy leader of the opposition, will cease interjecting. So will the member Barker. So I can hear from the manager of opposition business. Mr. Speaker, on any reasonable test of relevance, the prime minister has strayed a very long way away from this question. He should either be directed back to the terms of the question, or resume cease your to seat. Speak. The members, the members for McNamara and McEwen are not helping. The Prime Minister will return to the question, which was about rising costs of living and the compare and contrast at the end of the question, which I think started with. And I'm listening to him carefully, but I want silence so I can hear him. And if he strays, he will be returned to the question. We we'll give him the call. Uh, um, it, it was also about uh, former Liberal Party ministers yeah. and uh, Mr Porter's uh, colleague. I mean, knowing Clive Palmer's record for paying his workers, I hope, I hope Christian <laughs> Porter asks for his money up front. I hope you got that. I mean, together at last. Palmer and Porter, name a more iconic duo, I dare you. Order. Order. <laughs> Prime Minister has, has concluded his answer. The member for Wannan can resume his seat. Thank you. Order. Members on my left. Members on my, members on my left and right. When the House comes to order, I'll hear from the member. Spence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Government Services, and I refer to the Minister's answer on Tuesday. In light of Dr. Watt's review into contracts and procurements, why is disclosing conflicts of, in of interest important for public officials? 
give the call to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme and the Minister for Government Services. Uh, I, thank the I thank the member for his question. On Tuesday, I updated the House on a matter which went to the core of the Dr Watt review into procurements at the NDI and Services Australia. I refer to procurement contracts relating to business. unregistered lobbying firm Synergy 360 and multinational IT company the Unisys. The manager of opposition business will cease interjecting. A key red flag of Dr Watt's review is the failure to de declare conflicts, both real and perceived. And so far, I've been unable to locate any disclosure of the member for Fadden disclosing his relationship with Synergy 360 anywhere. Now, leaked emails from Unisys and Synergy 360 executives reveal how they plan to use the lobbying firm's special connection with the member for Fadden to gain special, privileged and commercially valuable access to the important uh, anti-corruption, the, the Ackley Committee in Parliament and also other decision makers in government. I quote directly from an internal email from the Unisys Vice President to Unisys Head Office in the States on the 16th of October. It glowingly reports, thanks for putting this together. I told Stuart I'd get him something tonight. Tomorrow at the Joint Committee for the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity, he'll be proposing the committee formally meets with Unisys for a briefing on our work with the US government. <laughs> There's another email between two of the owners of Synergy 360 on the 31st of October. They are excited at the big payday to be delivered by this undeclared special friendship with a member for Fadden. I quote, bloody amazing, considering we only officially launched on the 1st of June, some companies don't even make a profit, let alone clear 100,000 in the first three to four months. This year isn't over, so let's aim for a million dollars within the financial year. But this secret undisclosed trapdoor of influence offered Unisys boundless commercial opportunities. Unisys wrote to Mr Milo on the 25th of September 2017. I sent Stuart an email yesterday to follow up our meeting and request contact details for the appropriate person to arrange a presentation of the committee. The email continues. I also asked for his thoughts on delivering a similar presentation to the National Security Committee, what? the NSC. What? How does a multinational company form the presumption that they can talk to the heart of our national security architecture in Australia. The NSC is not some judge Minister of a skills. corporate beauty parade looking for contracts. Whatever the opposition leader and I think of each other, I know the opposition leader who served on the NSC does not see the NSC as some sort of trailer boot market on a Sunday where the security of the nation has to listen to a beauty parade of commercial vendors not with a relationship Order. not the disclosed by the member for Fadden. Concluded. The, the minister's time has concluded. The minister's time has concluded. He will resume his seat. Order. The member for Patterson. When the House comes to order, I'll hear from the member for Griffith. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Yesterday you said you couldn't organise a national rent freeze because of the constitution, but during the pandemic, National Cabinet regulated rentals with a moratorium on evictions. As well as making proposals to National Cabinet, the federal government has the power to offer grants on the condition that states freeze rent increases. The government uses the same power to regulate health and education. With so many renters one rent increase away from eviction, will you finally take national leadership and coordinate a national freeze on rent increases? I give the call to the Prime Minister. Um, in part, I thank the member for his question, which in part he answered. He answered himself. Uh, during the pandemic, there were a range of things occurred uh, with the support of everyone in this parliament. Uh, there was, for example, a, a circumstance whereby we were paying people's wages. We don't pay people's wages today. Uh, we the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Order. The Prime Minister will pause. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. O order. No. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. We've, it's, it's been a big two weeks, but I'm just going to say to her, she's on a warning now. She interjects again. 
she will definitely be asked to leave. Give the call to the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There were a range of emergency measures put in place over workplaces, support for businesses. Uh, state governments made those decisions. Uh, the idea that the national government has the power to impose a rent freeze, that is essentially to nationalise the private rental market around Australia, is just not the case. It's just not the case. And the member knows that that's the case. What we have is real solutions being put forward, and that is a national housing Please, accord. That is the Commonwealth State Housing Agreement, which is where the Commonwealth, together with the states, negotiates in a way in which states then don't say, yet yeah, we'll bank that money and withdraw our investment by the amount that the Commonwealth puts in, which is why you need to have that negotiation. This isn't an SRC. This is a national government. This is a national government. And what national governments have to do is put forward real solutions to issues. Order. Members on my and that's right. why we will also have our national homelessness Macamara. strategy. But that's why the national the, the, the Housing Australia Future Fund, which will provide 30,000 additional homes that are affordable or social, 4,000 of which will be reserved for women and children escaping domestic violence, will provide funding for veterans at risk of homelessness, Order. will provide $100 million for, for emergency skills. housing, will provide support to repair Indigenous housing in remote communities should be passed. Now, those opposite, and you can argue during the break if you want, that you're against $10 billion of funding because you think it should be $20 billion, or whatever figure you want to, to pluck out. But the idea that you will support zero, which is what opposing this legislation will do, we will, let, we will let members in your electorate know exactly that that's the case. That that is exactly the case. So I'd say, I'd say to the member and his colleagues, vote for this legislation and support it. Time has concluded. Order. The House comes to order. I'll hear from the member for Macon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. What action is the Albanese government taking to make it easier for Australians to see a doctor? And why is action needed to improve primary health care? Give the call to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. Well, I thank my friend and electorate neighbour for that question because he knows that the government has no higher priority than strengthening Medicare and making it easier to see a doctor. That's why we established the $750 million Strengthening Medicare Fund and a task force of nurses, patients, doctors and policy experts to help advise us on tackling the enormous challenges we inherited after nine years of cuts and neglect. That's why in the October budget we invested $2.9 billion in new primary care measures, which includes $220 million of grants to every general practice in Australia to help them improve patient access, their IT systems and their facilities. We're investing over $160 million to attract and retain more doctors and health workers in rural and regional Australia. And in Tasmania, we're working with the state government, a Liberal state government, to expand the single employer model down there that will make training and working in a general practice more attractive for our young doctors, growing the future health workforce of Australia. And Mr Speaker, we're also delivering our 50 urgent care services across Australia this year, providing care out in the community for those non-life-threatening emergencies, seven days a week, extended hours from 8am to 10pm and, importantly, fully bulk billed, free of charge, taking pressure off our stressed hospital emergency departments. But, Mr Speaker, I'm asked why action is needed to improve uh, primary care. And the fact is Longman. that primary care is in its worst shape in 40 years of Medicare. And there is no single person in this country more responsible for the crisis in Medicare than the Leader of the Opposition. When he was Minister for Health, 
He tried to introduce a tax on every single Australian every single time they visited the doctor. And when Labor blocked him in the other place, the Leader of the Opposition said proudly that he would, and I quote, do whatever it takes to get around our blockage. Do whatever it takes. And so instead, he started a six year long freeze in the Medicare rebate. A freeze later described Order. by the AMA Order. as a sneaky the new the tax opposition, that the punishes the Hume, every Australian the family. The Hume will that cease freeze ejecting. ripped billions and billions Order. of dollars Members out of Medicare. And patients Hume, and doctors in Australia right now are paying the price the for the decisions made by the Leader of the Opposition. The now, whether it's his attempt to introduce interjecting. his GP tax, whether it's his dearer medicines policy, whether it's his Medicare rebate freeze, his attempt to put a tax on every Australian visiting the emergency department in their local hospital, it is no wonder, Mr Speaker, that Australian doctors overwhelmingly Order. voted this man, who is smiling about it as I speak, as Australia's Order. worst the health minister, minister in the history of Medicare. Has concluded. Give a call to the member for Page. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. If The Voice offers advice on a policy matter that is contrary to the view of local elders and Indigenous community, how will this conflict be resolved? For example, if a local Indigenous community wanted to reintroduce the cashless debit card against the advice of The Voice, how would this be resolved? Order. Members on my left. The Minister for Home Affairs and the Minister for Skills, if they continue to interject, will be warned and asked to leave the chamber. And the Minister for the Environment will cease interjecting. Give the call to the Prime Minister. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. An Indigenous advisory body that's established by the Constitution and which provides non binding advice to the Parliament about Indigenous affairs is the best way of addressing the need for practical guarantees that policy making will be done better in the future without undermining Member the fundamental taken. structure of the Constitution. That's my view. It's also the view of the, the member for Bowman. shadow minister, because they're his words. Yeah. It the cannot veto parliament, but rather it provides greater input into the policy-making process, which should lead to policy improvements and greater buy-in from Indigenous people across Australia. Also, a uh, very important uh, point going forward. The member for Deakin. Uh, the member for Deakin. <coughs> Cease interjecting. That is why. And uh, further on, further on, uh, that is also the member for Barara. But I do want to say uh, that on the uh, on the opposition's uh, tactics, uh, we know that Noel Pearson had something important to say as well. And Noel Pearson, I would hope, is someone that's respected by everyone uh, in Gibson. this chamber. I've heard him quoted by Member people right across the parliament rejecting. in the past. And what he said was this. Now's the time for us to act as Australians, not as Labor people, not as Greens, not as Liberal or National Party people. By the Order. way, not as Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, but as Australians. Because what we're trying Member to achieve here Bowman. is our unity. We want inclusion. This will do it. Prime Minister concluded his answer. Give the call to the member for Pearce. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Leader of the House. What has been the Albanese Labor government's approach to passing its agenda through the Parliament? And what, a project, what approaches has the government rejected? Give the call to the Leader of the House. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Pearce uh, for the, the question. We've now, we've now completed 50 sitting days. 50 sitting days have been completed. And in that time, we have had a different approach uh, to our predecessors, uh, one of whom, the previous member for Pearce, had been a leader of the House. Uh, and one of the big changes is we debate legislation without shutting people down. We've now had, over those Order. 50 sitting days, we've had more than 2,000 speeches on legislation. More than 2,000. Over the same time period, 
That is 60 hours of additional debate on legislation compared to what happened opposite. Now, the 60-hour figure is a convenient the one because they've got a 60-hour statistic of their own. Their 60-hour statistic is they spent 60 hours in divisions voting whether the member should be no further heard or whether the question should be put. And I had hoped at the end of this session, when, we, when I was asked a similar question at the end of last Order. year, I was able to report then that there had been no case where anyone had moved that the member be no further member heard. It used to be staple for leaders of the House, including the one who is now the Leader of the Opposition. But last week we, the record got smashed. But who moved that the members be no further heard? Over there. Even in opposition, even in opposition, they are still addicted to silencing debate. This morning, there weren't many people in the chamber. But this morning, we had a standing orders debate, and in the standing orders debate, the member of, manager of opposition business referred to the right of members, the right, like a democratic right, to be able to move that someone else not be allowed to make a sound. Now. We've all Order. seen movies where someone gets told you have, you have the right to be silent. According to them, you have the right to, si right to silence everybody else. That's their approach. But as we've had these debates, where the former Leader of the House, now Leader of the Opposition, when he was Leader of the House, wanted to shut down debate, in his next job wants to keep shutting down debate. Similar parody, actually, for his predecessor, the former member for Pearce, when he was Leader of the House, wanted to back Clive Palmer, now wants to be employed by Clive Palmer. It's all, it's all continued. But in that time, Order. we now have legislation. The Leader will pause. Order. Members on, my, members on my right, the Minister for Veterans Affairs. Hear from the deputy leader of the opposition. A point of order. A uh, point of order, Mr. Speaker, on relevance, but you may not like it. But this government's priorities are totally oh, warped. <laughs> leader will just resume his seat while I order. I think the deputy leader of the opposition knows what's coming, and as a result of the abuse of standing orders, she will leave the chamber under 94A. And the Leader of the House will continue for the remainder of the time. As a result of that, our aged care reforms are now law. Paid family and domestic violence leave, now law. A national anti-corruption commission, now law. The electric vehicles tax discount, now law. Jobs and Skills Australia, now law. Cheaper medicines, now law. Cheaper childcare, now law. Getting wages moving, now law. The climate change targets and the safeguard reforms, now law. Improved paid parental leave, now law. The National Reconstruction Fund, now our law, with those opposite saying no. Order. Give it call. Order. Order. Members banging on desks is highly disorderly. The, member for, uh, the Prime Minister has the call. Order. 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 Members on my left and right. I know it's the last day, but can everyone. Pause so I can hear from the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper.